So I'm going to continue this story. It's like a bit of a story because, um, as you can see, that I don't, I'm not doing any detailed calculation of anything. I just want to give you a flavor of various processes which are important during galaxy formation. And I hope that you will go back and look at some of these things in more detail if you are interested. And uh, hopefully you will get interested at some stage in your life. Lots of physics out here. We stopped here. <clears throat> we looked at um, the cooling and said that uh, the basic thing which sets the mass scale of galaxies is whether the gas can cool within the dynamical time scale. And we then started wondering about the first stars. The first stars are interesting, and one would think maybe simpler to think about, but as you will see, it's not as simple everything. So basically, the, one imagines the initial conditions and the physical conditions of the uh, universe is much simpler for the first star formation. So you have the universe has expanding, the, the gas is kind of decoupled, from the radiation, the baryons are cooling down. As the dark matter potentials are also growing, there's in the typical lambda CDM picture, the first masses to collapse will be smaller masses, and they're building up to larger and larger masses. As the gas is cooling, the genes mass is also evolving. The genes mass, if you remember, is the mass which would collapse uh, against, so that is, if you take any particular gas cloud, for example, or a dark matter distribution, and you have a certain force due to gravity which is causing the stuff to collapse, then this has to overcome both pressure gradients in gas, and it has to overcome expansion in, in an expanding universe. And if you're thinking about the baryons, and you're thinking about the baryons being captured into collapsed objects, Basically, it has to overcome pressure gradient. So if the mass is large enough, then the gravity overcomes the pressure gradient. You can compare, for example, the free fall time scale neglecting pressure against the sound crossing time scale, which will readjust pressure in fluids. And this comparison will give you a typical mass scale called the genes mass. And the genes mass keeps going down because uh, the density is going down, so gravity in that sense is weakening, but the temperature is going down also faster. And the temperature is going down, and the genes mass comes with a higher power of temperature. And so you will get the genes mass effectively going down. So the gas can get captured into potential wells of the dark matter at some stage. When this happens, you can ask again the question whether the gas can cool or not, so that it can form structures, collapse structures. And we already said that there's a, uh, there's a temperature of about 10 to the 4 degree Kelvin, where you do not get atomic cooling. And so the first halos where the gas has collapsed, the first nonlinear halos which capture the gas at redshifts of 20 and 30, do have a virial temperature less than this temperature, 10 to the 4 degree Kelvin which we said is all related to the, we related everything to the mass from the spherical model. And so they will not cool by atomic line cooling emission. But if you have molecule formation, and we described a little bit yesterday about how molecules, hydrogen molecules could form, then you can have the possibility that you have molecular line cooling because at any particular temperature, there'll be collisions between these molecules that could excite the rotational energy level and then de-excite it by radiating away a photon. And so you lose energy from the system from molecular lines. And this is what would first happen. And this was the cooling curve for molecular cooling with some fraction in molecules taken from a paper by Lloyd Long back with some density of hydrogen. And it is not as efficient as atomic cooling, but it does, it's not as precipitous in falling down as the atomic cooling curve here. Okay. And if you look at what kind of objects can form due to molecular line cooling, what is shown here is also from Barkana and Loeb, the mass versus the redshift, the collapse masses versus redshift. And 
these three different curves of a one sigma, two sigma, and three sigma fluctuations. And by now, we should all be experts at what you mean by a one sigma fluctuation. Asim must have told you uh, about various statistical things. So one sigma are the typical density fluctuations. And those will follow, uh, they will, the mass which is becoming nonlinear will keep increasing with time. And if the density fluctuation is twice as big and thrice as big, it will come to a mass will collapse, a particular mass can collapse at a higher redshift. So for example, today the typical masses which are collapsing are about 10 to the 13 solar mass if you followed one sigma fluctuation. But we know that there are rich clusters of galaxies which are at least 100 times more massive. And that's likely to be rarer fluctuations in the original Gaussian random field of three sigma. So what is shown in these horizontal curves are the mass scales which could collapse if only atomic cooling was important. Anything above this can collapse. Okay? And there would be, of course, an upper limit from the cooling time scale also. And, but if you allow for molecular line cooling, smaller mass halos could capture, which capture baryons, that baryons can also cool efficiently to collapse inside smaller mass halos. So you would tend to form <coughs> stars. I mean, you want to form stars from this core collapsing gas. And one would imagine, and one would like to know, what are these first stars? You have only hydrogen, you have only helium, and you have no very little heavy elements present, very minute form, things which are formed in the beginning from the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And you are allowed to have molecular cooling now. The molecular cooling itself is not efficient below about 100 degree Kelvin, because even the molecular, the rotational energy levels have a spacing. And you cannot emit a photon which is smaller than that, so you cannot lose energy which is below a certain uh, level, certain energy corresponding to the spacing. Because H2 molecule is also symmetric, the lowest transition is J equal to 2 to J equal to, to the ground state. You know the J is the quantum number for rotational uh, quantum numbers, which you will have in quantum mechanics if you have the angular momentum. Okay. So that sets a lower limit. I mean, sorry, a limit on the temperature. You can't cool the gas below that. Also, if you have very high densities, so suppose the gas can cool and it's collapsing, and the density keeps increasing, we are above a certain density of about 10 to the 4 degree Kelvin, sorry, 4, 10 to the 4 particles per centimeter cube, the collisional de-excitation becomes more efficient than radiative de-excitation. That is, you have excited the H2 molecule to a upper rotational level, and now it has to lose the photon. There's a transition probability for this. So there would be a certain rate at which things will go down and lose the photon and lose energy. But if collisions occur faster, then it could make to take away this energy faster than the radiation can be emitted. And this happens above about 10 to the 4. So that sets typical temperature and mass scale, or sorry, density scales for you to be able to <clears throat> uh, cool efficiently through molecular radiation, molecular line radiation. And that gives you a typical genes mass, a mass which can collapse. And that mass turns out to be almost about 1,000 solar mass. Still nowhere near masses of stars that we see today. So now you imagine that this gas cloud of about 1,000 solar mass is, about, is gravitationally unstable. It's made out of hydrogen molecule, it's made out of hydrogen gas, and it's collapsing. And as it's collapsing, will you be able to, its density keeps increasing. When density keeps increasing, you could, in principle, get smaller and smaller masses going unstable, provided the temperature doesn't increase. But since you cannot radiate away the energy, this need not happen. So it was originally thought that actually the first objects which form would be very massive stars. For example, it was thought to be about 100 solar mass and all that. But there are things which are coming in the way because there will always be some angular momentum. I don't know whether you have been told, and I will say it a little later again, that angular momentum is also something which starts from zero. It's not these dark matter halos or dark matter perturbations which are 
turning around and collapsing. It's not that they have angular momentum to begin with. The way in which things are supposed to acquire angular momentum is by tidal torquing. No perturbation is purely spherical. So the perturbation is maybe slightly uh, elongated in some direction, maybe an oblate or triaxial uh, spheroidal distribution. It's looking at neighboring perturbations which are also collapsing. And so there is a gravitational tidal force on this. So if you have a non-spherical perturbation, which is trying to collapse, and you have neighboring guys which are exerting tides, like the Earth or the Moon exerts on the Earth, okay, then this force can spin up or give some angular torques to this perturbation which is growing. There is also something which was calculated long time back <coughs> by various people, and the maximum torque you get is when the perturbation is grown the maximum extent. But that's where the moment of inertia is the largest. Okay? And then when it collapses, it's too compact to get enough torque. And typically, in dark matter halos, you get about 5% of the angular momentum required for rotational support. What that means is that if you get some angular momentum and you think that will this be able to now stop collapses, it will not be able to. You can calculate the, how much torque you get or you can simulate, and that's more than when you calculate. And you get about 5%, but it's not a rigid number. There's a whole distribution of something called the lambda parameter for the halos. And that angular momentum is there. So the gas is trying to collapse. It cannot collapse beyond a certain amount because as it collapses, if it conserves angular momentum, it will also spin up. And if it spins up, now it will become more and more rotationally supported. So typically what would happen is that you form a disk. And it's very simple to form disks rather than, uh, rather than spheres because of this angular momentum conservation. But material will keep on raining down on this disk and a core could be formed and the core would keep growing because the disk would have some viscosity, there will be an accretion and the material will keep coming onto the, uh, being accreted into the central regions of the disk. And the first star is supposed to, will form in the centers of these disk-like regions. Okay? But since the mass scale is itself very large, you expect it to have the first star to be also massive. But to do this properly, you have to do numerical simulation, and you have to put as much physics as you, as you can to do this. Now, it, uh, one of the more recent simulations is by these authors, Clark et al. And that's what I'm uh, showing in this next slide. So, <coughs> so it's an interesting paper, and what they follow, the evolution of this collapse of the to form the first star. And you can see now the densities are like 10 to the 18, is it 18? 16, sorry, 16 particle per centimeter cubed at the highest density. So you are trying to resolve a lot of stuff, so you have to actually not, you cannot do this in a single simulation. You have to take some output of an earlier stuff and re-simulate with higher resolution or to do some adaptive, adaptive mesh kind of refinement kind of stuff. And one does form this disk here with a central star here. But they, what they found is that very soon this disk itself becomes gravitationally unstable. It becomes gravitationally unstable because it's a massive disk. It's not got any underlying, it's no longer dark matter dominated, for example. It has left the dark matter far behind. And it's collapsed right to very central regions of this halo. The length scale here is 40, 40 astronomical units. One astronomical unit, recall, is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, right? So, so it's, almost, it's like the size of our solar system now, this simulation. And you follow this formation of the disk, all these masses come into this disk. As the mass keeps getting accreted, the gravitational instability in the disk leads to spiral structure in the simulation. And parts of that spiral itself becomes unstable and form more stars a second star, a third star, a fourth star. What they call a star is something which goes beyond the density which they can follow and where all the flows are converging. And so they just put a sink particle there which will keep accreting other stuff. Because 
to get a star, you have to follow another 10 orders of magnitude or something, or at least 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 24, okay, <coughs> eight orders of magnitude. So, but what they, they do find is that these stars which form has a broad spectrum of masses, but are on the heavier side. They are on the sizes of about tens of solar masses instead of one solar mass. And that's because the gene's mass is not able to decrease because the cooling cannot proceed beyond a certain temperature. Okay? And that's the basic reason why you always get more massive stars as the first stars. People thought there would be about 100 solar masses, even a few, even about 10 years before this kind of simulation. And this has also changed in the last uh, uh, half a dozen years or so, that simulations are now able to do these things better. And, but still, tens of solar mass, it's still not like our sun. These stars would evolve very rapidly and they will blow up. They will process heavy elements. They will cook ele heavy elements in their interior and they will blow a supernovae and they will seed the rest of the gas with these heavier elements. And that means that the first star formation more or less kills itself. And the way it kills itself is also called feedback from the first stars. Feedback means getting back. I mean, we all get fed, but now we feed back. And the first stars, what they do is they have various processes which actually prevents too many first stars being formed even in the neighborhood of themselves. Firstly, because the stars are massive, they emit a lot of ultraviolet photons. And because they emit a lot of ultraviolet photons, almost 10 times more ionizing photon per baryon compared to the normal stellar mass function that I'll talk about a little later. So the photons themselves can go and ionize the rest of the material and increase the temperature. Okay. Secondly, the softer photons, the photons which are slightly smaller in frequency, compared to these ionizing photons, can go and disassociate H2 molecules. So you have formed these H2 molecules to cool the gas, but you get, get destroyed the H2 molecules by shining it with photons, which will have enough energy to unbind the molecule, which is very loosely bound. There is also, if you have binaries formed, for example, in the first stars, their X-rays can increase electrons they can do an opposite thing and ionize stuff and increase electrons and catalyze further H2 molecules. So you can see both positive and negative feedbacks coming in. The first supernovae will distribute heavy elements. And if these can be mixed with the rest of the gas, then there is possibility of higher amount of cooling now, because now you have met metals in the gas. And so you can go to lower temperature and form different types of stars. So there's all kinds of feedback. There is chemical feedback from the first heavy element enrichment. There is kinetic feedback from the first supernovae. There is radiative feedback from the first ionizing photons and soft photons. Things which I'm not going to really talk about are magnetic feedback, etc. So the first star formation is perhaps simple, but the feedback from the first stars are very messy. And so it's a nice thing to, it has been a nice exercise to think about the first star formation, but it is again not a, something which is now written in stone as to what all will happen and how the universe will progress from first stars to later stars. Okay, so what about later star formation? Here, oh, okay, okay, I forgot. This is the a dynamo. Uh, there's a simulation of first star formation and magnetic field generation by Sharanya Sure, who is in Bangalore here in an Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And they did fantastically interesting work on this, um, how magnetic fields can grow just during the first star uh, formation. Okay. So <laughs> when you go to the next other star formation, the basic thing is since there is no ab initio theory of star formation. I mean, there are lots of interesting ideas, there are lots of simulations, but it's not something which is like the linear perturbation theory of gravitational instability. So you do require lots of inputs from observations. 
and the observational input is much better to get from our own galaxy. So if you are interested in galaxy formation, you should be interested in star formation. And if you're interested in star formation, you should be interested in our galaxy and the interstellar medium and all the processes which are happening in our galaxy. And what the questions that we would like to answer as a person who wants to simulate galaxy formation eventually or understand is if you are thinking about star formation, what drives the star formation? Of course, gravitational instability, but what sets, for example, the masses of the stars that you see today? What sets the efficiency of star formation? The rate at which stars form. So can you, for example, say that if I have uh, one-sixth of the universe in baryons, all those baryons will get converted to stars? Some fraction of it will get converted. How much fraction? At what rate? At what rate will decide for you how bright the thing is, or how bright the galaxy is? At what masses of stars you form will also dis decide for you how much radiation you get in different wave bands. So when you want to make, for example, use a survey of galaxies to infer your favorite cosmological parameter, you need to know what galaxy you should put in any halo. And for that, you need to know how much light a particular given something will shine. And so you need to understand this. So, <clears throat> oh, what happened here? Something happened. Yes, I should say. Or you wanted to access the network. No? Okay. I should say no to everything or yes to everything. Okay, so in our galaxy, stars form in what are called giant molecular clouds. These are basically clouds which are predominantly molecular, like H2 molecule. And here, for example, the hydrogen molecule, it's easier for it to form in our galaxy because firstly, there are lots of electrons. And secondly, it's not as if two symmetric guys has to come collide, do something and all that, there is dust. There's all kinds of dust grains in our galaxy which can take away momentum and it can aid also the H2 molecule formation. So just to give you an idea of what is a molecular cloud, I don't know whether this thing can see nicely. We can put off this light if it's possible. I don't know whether you can see. This is part of the, it is called the horse head nebulae. Okay. And is there a way to put the light off? The board lights? Oh, any light, it's okay. It's okay, I think it's pretty pictures you can always see. Uh, <laughs> you know. So this is called the horse head nebulae. It doesn't look like a horse here. There are other pictures where it will look like a horse head. Okay. Here it's an infrared light and it's taken by the Hubble, um, uh, it's a Hubble uh, heritage uh, picture. and. Of course, it looks fantastically pretty. It's in infrared, and it's being sh there is some thing shining from behind, lighting it up. You can see it's like the clouds that you would see in our sky or something. There's all kinds of complicated structure. So when I'm talking about a molecular cloud, I don't mean a spherically symmetric, nice, fantastic, smooth, with some density distribution and all that. It's actually fairly complex, and you... You'll see all kinds of uh, structures. You can make some fractal analysis. You'll find things are turbulent. And uh, this, this is only part of what is called the Orion Nebula, where stars are forming in abundance in our galaxy. So molecular clouds are the sites for star formation in our galaxy. And they have typical masses of about 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 solar mass. They have fairly large hydrogen, molecular hydrogen density. Yeah. Ah, okay, thanks. <laughs> of about 100 to 500 particles per centimeter cube. They're fairly cold because they've been cooled by both hydrogen molecules. They've also been cooled by CO molecules. Okay, and metals. So they're fairly cold. And they have, if you take this density and if you take this temperature, Oh, sorry, if you take this density, you can calculate the free fall time of such a molecular cloud. 
So if you have this molecular cloud and only gravity were to act, how long would it last before it just collapses in various ways? That is, you just say one upon root zero or something. And so that's about a million years, few million years. So it only lasts for a few million years. Remember that our galaxy may be 10 billion years old at least. So it's a very small fraction of the lifetime of our galaxy. So it's not as if this like eternal cloud which is there, it's all the time forming, all the time just being destroyed, all the time forming stars. If you take the gene's mass with that density and that temperature, it's about 40 solar masses. So now closer to solar masses, but not yet the solar mass. Okay? So these are the sites where one can actually see young stars and where one thinks that stars are forming in abundance, these molecular clouds, where things can pool sufficiently. So of course, our idea would be to ask, can you form such clouds in a galaxy and how do such clouds form in the galaxy? And again, we have to take we have to take help from uh, what we can see in our own galaxy and ideas from how molecular clouds could form in our galaxy. There could be various types of instabilities. For example, people have thought about thermal instability. Thermal instability occurs when gas cools and you have a slightly overdense region which cools faster than the surrounding, so it gets compressed and then it cools faster and so things run away. And then you have structures which can form from cooling gas. But if you look at the internal pressures in molecular cloud, they're much bigger than the interstellar medium, warm interstellar medium pressure outside. So it's not likely to form that. More likely is disk gravitational instability. That is, we have our galactic disk in our galaxy. <clears throat> and there is also always gravity which makes things unstable. Now, gravity has to compete with pressure, and that's where you get the gene's mass. In a rotating system, and we already know in an expanding universe, gravity has to compete with expansion. And that's why exponential genes instability, exponentially growing instability, gets tempered to a power law growing instability in the expanding universe. In a rotating system like the disk of our galaxy, gravity also has to compete with angular momentum. So there is a new scale which is involved. If things are too big, then if it was only competing with pressure, then things could collapse. Bigger guys will collapse for better. There's a gene's mass is kind of a lower limit above which all mass scales can collapse. But because of angular momentum, bigger guys will have more angular momentum. And so it will not, there will be limiting from both ends and the critical, uh, uh, parameter which decides whether things can collapse is called the Tumre Q parameter, introduced by Alar Tumre a long time back, and it and it depends on both the sound speed and what is called the epicyclic frequency, which is just related to the rotation and the angular frequency, and the density here, the surface density of the disk. And this, if it's of order one, things can become unstable. And from that, you also get the fastest growing mode in a disk. And that fastest growing mode in a disk depends also on the surface density, and it's about few times 10 to the 7 solar mass. So this is something which is closer to the million solar mass. So maybe molecular clouds form when the disk becomes unstable to gravity with competition from, from the angular momentum. <clears throat> you could also have things like turbulence doing something, uh, but it needs a source, okay? And one source could be, for example, all these cold accretion flows which are raining into the disk of the galaxy. They are really hitting the disk and maybe stirring it up. There is a very interesting instability which needs ordered magnetic fields called the Parker instability. And there, the Parker instability is basically if you have lots of magnetic fields, and you have roughly equal pressure between the magnetized and the unmagnetized region, then the magnetized region will have less gas pressure because the pressure balance, magnetic fields will contribute to some of the pressure. Then it can become buoyant because if you have less gas pressure, you have less density corresponding to surrounding, it's like a lower density 
thing put in a higher density medium and against gravity, it can, these regions can become buoyant and rise. As it rises, it will bend the field lines. When it bends the field lines, there's an opposing tension which wants it to spring back. And so there are, again, typical length scales, which is worked out by Parker. And again, you can get clouds being formed at the, when you have this Parker instability, field lines can escape, matter can rain down these field lines and gather into clouds. It can form in shocks, and there are shocks in spiral structure. And when two galaxies merge, of course, you'll get all kinds of things happening. Okay? So these are the known processes by which clouds can form, big clouds can form in our galaxy or in the galactic environment. And one imagines that such a process is, could also occur in the first galaxy that you form. Because you have to start from the gas, you cool it, you form, form denser gas, then you have to somehow get into very cold medium so that gravity can finally make a star. Okay? And this is the things which are uh, possible. So which... <coughs> Now, there are also empirical observations about star formation in our galaxy. And there are two observations which I want to emphasize. One is the rate of star formation. So what this flow shows is a very old and now well-established relation, first due to Kennicott, of the rate at which stars are forming, solar mass per year per kilo per six square, versus the surface density of our disk, of the galactic disk. And that seems to be a nice linear relation. Higher the density, the higher the rate of star formation. And you can roughly understand this by saying that the rate at which stars form will depend upon the amount of gas that you have and some kind of dynamical time scale that you have. Okay? And the dynamical time scale goes as 1 over root g rho. And so this should go as rho to the 1.5. If you have a constant height disk, the volume density can be same as, it will be proportional to the surface density in the disk. So, possibly you may be able to say that the rate of star formation goes as one, three by two of the density of the gas. This slope is about 1.4. So it's not very much far off if you want to understand this law. It's called the Kennicott-Schmidt law. Yep. Sorry? In this plot, in that, no, 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 I'm just, it's just local stuff. There is some constant rho gas in the disk, and then that's going to become unstable on some time scale associated with the free fall time scale at that density. So it's a very simple, simplistic argument. Oh, gas doesn't form on the dust, only the molecules can get catalyzed on the dust. This is the total gas density, whether it's H1, H2, whatever you have in the disk. The puzzle, little bit of a puzzle, and it's been a puzzle for some time, is that there's an efficiency factor here. And if you fit, fit this straight line, it turns out that the efficiency factor is about 2%. So you have the gas ready for star formation. You think that it will form stars at a certain rate, governed by the dynamical time scale here has been replaced by the rotation free time scale. Okay, it's all related. But this star formation is not very efficient. It's only efficient at a few percent level. So one of the big puzzles of star formation has been why is star formation so inefficient? In principle, it could form at faster rates. Okay? So the efficiency of star formation is low. Now, if you are a guy who is just blindly doing galaxy formation from structure formation point of view, you will simply put some efficiency factor in star formation to convert into the number of stars formed, and you will calculate from that how much luminosity you have from the galaxy. You will calculate from that the reionization of the universe, everything. And there's a general law of astrophysics Everything is 10%. Okay. If you don't know something, you assume it to be 10%. Okay. I don't know whether you have ever assumed anything to be 10%. Of course, the Pakistan, there is some 10% there also. 
I mean, you can have 10% in various contexts. You can get 10% of whatever, right? So it's not 10%. It's maybe even less than 10%. So why is that? And what is it that makes stars form? Now, the way in which star formation was thought about in early 60s, for example, was that you have a gas cloud, you have a molecular cloud, it wants to form stars. But in our galaxy, magnetic fields are dominant. And these gas clouds are being supported by the magnetic pressure which is trying to oppose the collapse. And so you have to first lose this field. And how do you lose this field? This is all ideas due to Leon Mestel and Spitzer. That you have very neutral medium, but you have some ions. There's a Lorentz force due to the magnetic field that pushes on the ions. The ions and neutrals have a friction. So there's a small drift velocity of the ions and the magnetic field out of the system. And during this, it loses this flux, and then things can collapse. So star formation was thought to be a very quiet affair. There are clouds, they're supported, they're not supported. And people try to do all these kind of stuff. But there's been a complete paradigm shift in the way people are thinking about star formation. It turns out that for all the things that you want to understand, this observation about the rate of star formation and the one which I'll talk about, about the mass function of stars that you form, it requires turbulence as an essential ingredient of star formation. And there's a nice review by McKee and Ostriker, two of the very uh, people who have thought about almost everything in astrophysics. Uh, not very far back, only a decade back now. And have a look at uh, this. So, so what am I saying? I'm saying that this used to be the kind of uh, picture. But what turns out to happen is that you want to know, firstly, suppose given a gas cloud, how do you form stars of, let's say, solar mass? You have cooled the cloud. The cloud is genes unstable, but it is like 100 solar mass is the genes mass. Now, this will collapse. As it collapses, the density will increase. If you manage to keep the temperature the same, then your genes mass will go down. And smaller masses will become genes unstable. And smaller masses will become genes unstable. And you can fragment the cloud into smaller and smaller masses. And then you can form something. Now, this was called the hierarchical model of star formation. But of course, at some stage, you will stop. Because if the density becomes large enough, then whatever is cooling the system, like radiation, cannot even escape this medium. And then you go back to from isothermal collapse to an adiabatic collapse. Then when you collapse, the thing heats up. So you don't, genes mass don't go, out, go down. And that could set the lower limit of star formation, mass of star form. But this also doesn't seem to be the whole picture. That why do you get various, I mean, there is enough random velocities in, in these molecular clouds. I mean, you can look at the molecular line, they will have a certain width, and they will have velocities which are of the order of the sound speed or even larger. So one observes that there is supersonic turbulent motions within molecular clouds. And automatically, what turbulence does is to, if it's supersonic and compressible, is to gather material into dense regions. So the paradigm now is that you gather material into dense regions. These dense regions act as the seed for the star formation. And they will now collapse to form the stars. So you can try to argue in various ways. And there are interesting simulations. I don't know whether this can be seen. But so this is a molecular cloud which has been followed to collapse, to form stars. You form all kinds of stars. But there's an ultra problem also. The turbulence is needed to form seeds for star formation. But if you, it turns out if you just have the turbulence, the free fall time scale of the molecular cloud was a few million years. You will convert all the material into stars in that few million years. But the efficiency you want it to be low. So you should stop the star formation also after some time. 
So there's all, all kind of chicken and egg problem here. For that, you need again feedback. So although you may have heard about feedback in galaxy formation, which I'll come to, you straight away have to have feedback in star formation. That feedback could be due to enhanced turbulence. It can be due to magnetic fields and their forces. It can be due to jets and winds from the first stars. And we see, for example, in young stellar objects, they also have a creation disk, they have a star in the middle, they have an outflow, they have a jet, like you may have seen from active galaxy jets. Young stellar objects also have jets. These jets also energize the surrounding cloud. So you form stars, but you destroy the cloud sufficiently fast that you do not form the whole cloud into stars. Okay? That is a picture of the, I mean, there's a nice paper by Christoph Federath in, uh, in about 2015, where he's discussing this problem of efficiency of star formation. What these plots all show is that if you have only gravity and you convert 20% of the gas into stars within less than the free fall time. But if you have all these processes, magnetic fields, turbulence, jets, you maintain this whole thing for much longer time, and you can have an efficiency which is a few percent. There's a plot of efficiency versus the free fall time for these different processes. The solid curve is the one which is closest to observation. It has all the processes that I'm talking about. It has uh, influence of magnetic fields, it has influence of stirring by winds and jets, it has influence of the turbulent motions which are constantly being fed into this. So, the bottom line is that in our galaxy, stars are forming at a few percent efficiency in molecular clouds. Right now, the present understanding of why, how these stars form is that, of course, gravity is always the driver. And it's a gene's mass which is deciding everything. But the cloud is converting stars by, because there is supersonic turbulence going on, which is gathering high-dense regions in shocks. And these shock regions become gravitationally unstable and become stars. But before you make the whole cloud into stars, you destroy the cloud in some way, or you stop all the star formation by various feedback processes. The other observation which you have to understand is the masses of stars that you form, what is called the initial mass function of stars. So there are two very important observations. One is the rate at which you form stars, and the other is how many stars of various masses you form. Because this also will decide for you what a galaxy is and what it will look like and how it will react back on the rest of the surrounding. As I said, the first stars are forming with tens of solar masses. But the present-day star formation, the present-day stars have a distribution like this. It has a typical peak, the mass function, very similar to the mass function of galaxies or halos, which uh, Asim would have talked about. The mass number of stars per unit mass in per unit volume okay, has a typical power law type behavior, but it's a peak not at one solar mass. This is one solar mass log of m by m sun, but slightly less than one solar mass. And then a dip after that. So there's a lower mass cutoff, and there is a higher mass tail. And this, there is a slope of the higher mass tail, and different people have fitted different laws to this. The most famous being the saltpeter law, which is m to the minus 2.35. Okay? So <laughs> this is... 5m dm will be the number of stars that you form. So if you want stars per logarithmic interval in mass, you have to multiply this by m. So you have m to the minus 1.35, which at least if you integrate will not blow up. m to the minus 1 would have blown up logarithmically at the lower mass. And this will converge at higher mass, but it will blow up. But there will be a cutoff here. Okay? So for example, I am also showing here what is fit by what is called the scalo mass function. It's a broken power law. There are three power laws being fit here. So you want to understand this also. I mean, there are various other fits. 
This is also some other fits uh, from a nearby stellar cluster. So you want to also understand how, why is it that stars of about a solar mass or less are the typical masses that form as stars? And what determines how many higher mass stars form? Now, again, as I said, the main paradigm is gravitational gravity and turbulence. So what is shown here is some work by Klesen on the mass function of stars. You start with some initial particles and you drive turbulence inside. And gravitational instability causes, you, you have fluctuations inside actually, not turbulence. And that collapses. You can see the picture is not very dissimilar to large scale structure formation. You collapse into sheets, filaments, clumps, and then you gather stuff into points. And these are the distribution of clump masses. If you started a cloud with 10 to the 5 particles and 10K, you will get a genes mass of about one solar mass. Okay. So, so basically, okay, I will I will just skip all this. The basic schematic picture, there's a nice review which you can read, of which I have given a reference here by Bonnell et al. Again, about a decade old, but it's still very relevant um, on what sets the initial mass function. So the idea is the following that somehow you get a cloud which is turbulent to fragment into typical masses. And that sets a basic scale here, which could be the gene scale corresponding to solar mass or so. Then neighborings, then once you form these basic units, each star tries to eat as much of the surrounding gas as possible. Each protostar, not the star. So there is competitive accretion. If you have some amount of food and all of you start eating, then you will only get whatever food is near you. Okay. But of course, you're not distributed uniformly, like here. You're distributed in some random way. And so some guys will get more food, some guys will get less food. A guy which has eaten more food has more mass can eat even more. So the probability will be even larger. And so the more massive you are, the bigger you will become. So you will set up a general power law like this. And you can compute what that power law should be. For example, if you assume a simple law like m dot is m squared. So the more massive you are, the more faster you eat. And you integrate that and look at the distribution of number of masses that you will get. You will get a 1 over m power law instead of 1.35. So this competitive accretion is something which is thought to set the, the general tail, power law tail of the star form, of the initial mass function. I may have done something. Then what about the lowest cutoff? Once you have formed these stars, the smaller mass clumps are thought to have been ejected out. And are no longer, of course, there's a cutoff from nuclear burning like at the Jupiter mass. Okay. But there's a cutoff in the initial mass function much before that. As you see from this plot here, the cutoff here, turnaround is at, you know, larger than 10 to the minus one solar masses. The Jupiter mass is 10 to the minus three solar mass, something like that, okay. of that order. So it will, it's a cutoff which is determined even before. Now, Suppose this lower mass cutoff was not 0.1 solar mass, but one solar mass, or if it's few solar masses, observational properties of stars will differ considerably. Because once you're given a bunch of stars in your, in, in, in your system, each star, now you have a different physics going on. Each star is doing its own thing, it's evolving. It's burning fuel to shine. Higher the mass of star, the faster it's burning stuff, emitting more light, more ultraviolet radiation, lasting smaller amount of time. So things will all very crucially depend upon your assumption of what is your initial mass function and what is the rate at which you form stars. So these are the two things which I wanted to say. Okay, I will not say too much. Okay. So uh, I will take... I think 10 minutes I have or? Yeah. So we have formed stars. So we
we have done two things in some rough qualitative way. We have started from gas, we have cooled it to collapse it and make it survive a hierarchical buildup of structure. We have said something about how, what are the, some issues involved in taking this gas, cool, collapsing gas, to convert it into stars. Not that I have solved any problem, not that anybody has solved this problem. I'm just pointing out the crucial, the importance of this problem. Once you have stars, then you can ask, how does the galaxy look? So I want to say something before ending this lecture, from stars to light. And here, of course, again, you can see how intricately, if you're thinking about cosmology, it's related to all of astrophysics. And that's why it's good for all of you, I mean, now I'll be giving my bashan, <laughs> to not just think in terms of uh, one particular corner of uh, the universe and one particular subject that you're working on, but to have a broad appreciation of general astronomy and astrophysics. And this is what I've shown in this part of the curve, is the evolution of uh, emitted light from a bunch of stars, assuming uh, the saltpeter mass function, assuming abundance, the solar abundance, that stars are being formed, and different times. So what is shown here is the flux, F lambda is the luminosity per angle in terms of the solar luminosity per angstrom per solar mass of star formed. So imagine that you have taken one solar mass of material and converted it into stars. Of course, you don't have one solar mass, you only become one star. So you can multiply this by 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9, however many solar masses you want, <clears throat> and that will give you a normalization here. If you integrate over wavelength, you'll get a luminosity. And what is shown in this part of the diagram is different times. This is 13 billion years, and this is 0 0.001 billion, which means a million year time scale. So in the beginning, once you, and what has been assumed is that this gas has been converted to stars instantaneously without any this thing. So at time t equal to zero, you are just given a whole bunch of stars with a saltpeter mass function at solar abundance. And now you ask, what happens? What, how do they shine? So if you have done stellar astrophysics, you will know that each individual star has a certain stellar evolution. It depends on the mass of the star, the metallicity of the star. The more massive stars live for a smaller amount of time, emit more higher energy radiation, okay? And then die, they may die probably as a supernova, or some, some of them may die as uh, collapsing to neutron stars. The less massive stars evolve more slowly and last longer time, and they are still there today. So initially, the flux, the radiation is dominated by the most massive stars because they're emitting the most amount of radiation. They're also emitting the highest energy radiation. So the spectrum is peaked in the ultraviolet and dips rapidly. As these stars die, and as you go to 10 to the 7 years, 10 to the 8 years, those very, young, those very massive stars have died, and then you lose the flux here drops down dramatically in the ultraviolet. 1,000 angstroms, below 1,000 angstrom, ultraviolet radiation about 10 to the 4 angstrom infrared radiation, 5,500 our sun, right? Some numbers to keep in mind. I hope, yeah, you know that our sun is 5,000 something. Yellow, red, blue, right? Ultraviolet. And as, you, as this thing ages to about 13 billion years, which is like present day age of the universe, most of the light is now coming more in infrared, than, and of course, optical is still there, infra, optical to infrared, ultraviolet has more or less gone. So when you are, this will be important when you're probing galaxies, because one of the ways I will probably have some time in the next uh, lecture to discuss, to probe high redshift galaxies, I should shut up in five minutes, is to, is, 
is what is called the Lyman break technique. And that picks out ultraviolet uh, radiating objects at higher and higher redshifts. So those are picking out young galaxies at high redshift. So that you are really looking at this kind of wavelengths. So this is something which you can calculate provided you have the initial mass function of stars. And you can see that completely determines how your stellar cluster should look at different times. The second thing, this plot, also taken from the same uh, paper, this called SCD is called the um, spectral energy distribution. Okay. Is, suppose you assume that the star formation was not instantaneous, but it was at decaying exponentially with time over a certain time scale. Okay. And these are, I think, three different, uh, four different plots, I think. Ah, no, they've assumed only, sorry, three giga years as the time scale over which the star formation rate decays exponentially. Given the star formation rate, for example, which I've called m dot sf as a function of time, and given this part of the diagram, which is how much energy is being emitted at any particular time when the star cluster is so much old, you can calculate the luminosity at any particular time. At a time capital T, this T is not temperature, sorry. Because you look back at T minus tau, ask how much energy is being emitted, convolve this with the star formation rate, and this will be the luminosity. So this luminosity, here they have assumed it's, this function here is exponential minus T by tau, with an exponential decay time scale of about three giga years. <clears throat> so three giga years is still fairly small compared to the age of the universe. And these plots are at different, different times uh, <clears throat> after that. And again, you can see an evolution in, in, in this whole thing. This is when the thing was very young. And after some time, at again, 13 giga years, 17, four, etc. You have all these characteristic features. I mean, since you're forming stars continuously, you will also be forming stars which are massive. Okay. You, they may be less in number, but still there. So you don't see this precipitous drop because there you form the stars in a burst. You will see at ultraviolet wavelengths the massive stars which have been born recently, within a few million years or so. Okay. In the infrared wavelengths, you will also see all the stars, cumulative effect of all the stars over the full range of time, from the time when it's born now, low mass stars, to those which have survived throughout the age. But the, you see characteristic feature, one of them is this, okay? <laughs> a break in the Lyman alpha, and that will be useful to detect high redshift galaxies, as I will talk about in next uh, lecture or so. So there are, given the star formation rate, which is what we talked about, given the initial mass function of the stars that you form, you can now predict the luminosity of the galaxy as a function of time. And now you can fold this up into all models that you have to predict what galaxies will look like if they formed stars at a certain times. So all these things are going into simulations which are predicting galaxy distributions. All these things are going into semi-analytic models which are trying to predict various observational properties of galaxies which will eventually be used to in, in surveys which you are, are doing various things. I think I should stop. Let me stop and then we'll come back to the latest part of the story um, after Three something, three fifteen, three fifteen after Varun's talk. Questions? Uh, I've been talking about free fall in so many different contexts. Free fall is just falling freely. Okay, when I'm talking about it, mostly I'm thinking about some time scale being involved, and the rough time scale is always that you don't worry about any other forces than gravity. 
and then say, if you have an overdense region, if you have a cloud, if you have a, a subclump, how long will just pure gravitational forces allow it to collapse to some, uh, let's say, factor of two or something like that? That's the time scale which I'm talking about. Then you compare it with various other time scales. If the free fall time scale is shorter than the sound crossing time scale in a gas cloud, sound waves will adjust pressure to prevent this free fall. If it's shorter, then it will still fall. If it's longer, then the pressure can readjust to stop the free fall. So that's one simple physical way of thinking about the gene's mass, for example. So, yes. More precisely, you have to go to the context and ask what is happening. You have to write down the equation, solve it either numerically or analytically, and find all the stuff. Okay, lunch. <laughs>